Hello, Internet. This is David Rovix with another episode of Discussions with David, a live stream broadcast I've been doing every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday during the pandemic, as long as I can't travel and play music for a living anymore. I'm also broadcasting on Mondays and Tuesdays. Mondays, I host Pandemic Open Mic Mondays, which anyone with a song, poem, or rant is encouraged to sign up for at davidrovix.com slash P-O-M-M. Tuesdays, I host Fifth Estate Live, produced by Peter Werby. All of these live stream broadcasts start at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT every weekday. And you can find them both live and in archive form on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Cable Community Radio, and my own Facebook pages and channels on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, VK, and LinkedIn. If you go to davidrovix.com or search on any podcasting platform for the podcast This Week with David Rovix, you can also find these programs in audio form soon after after they are broadcast live. Another place you can find the broadcasts, along with lots of free content, as well as content reserved only for patrons, such as my 16-part audio memoir, is at patreon.com slash davidrovix. That's also where you can support my various musical and non-musical efforts at Popular Education. Today, we are going to Salt Lake City, Utah, to talk with photojournalist Jeremy Harmon, who has been doing photography and writing fantastic articles as well for the Salt Lake Tribune, where he's been working since 2007. I met him in 2015 when I traveled to Salt Lake City to sing at an event commemorating the 100th anniversary of the execution of the Swedish-born organizer, songwriter, and cartoonist for the industrial workers of the world, Joe Hill. Leading up to the centenary, the Salt Lake Tribune published a whole bunch of Jeremy's articles about the history, which he researched extensively. He's also written more recent articles in the Salt Lake Tribune about other notable radicals who dwelt in Utah, such as Ammon Hennessy. Jeremy, welcome to Discussions with David. Thank you Glad for having me here. Hey, can you, um, before we start talking about history, I wonder if you can just give us uh, some impressions about what's been going on in Salt Lake City over the past few weeks and months of protests and pandemic. Any statues come down around there? Well, we haven't had a statue come down yet. Uh, there was a, a statue of uh, Brigham Young uh, was vandalized um, and probably like, you know, red paint splashed on it, racist painted on it, things like that. Um, yeah, but I, what's happening here is really similar to what's happening everywhere else right now. You know, we've had, there's been daily protests, you know, marches. Um, it started, uh, the, the first, the first one was in the end of May and it, there's only been one day where we haven't since then that there hasn't been some kind of protest, some kind of March, some kind of action, mm. um, in Salt Lake city. Um, they vary in size from maybe a hundred people show up up to thousands. And mm. so um, it's, um, you know, working in the photo department at the Tribune, it has uh, certainly kept us busy. It's, it's a pretty thousands exciting time. Of people, thousands of people in Salt Lake City at a protest is um, probably the most that there's been at a protest in Salt Lake City since 2003 or something. Or uh, uh, ever. Any idea? Ever? Ever. Yeah. Um, I'm hard pressed to think of one that was bigger. I mean, even, um, you know, the, the, there were some interesting things that were going on like here in the sixties with the civil rights movement and, uh, you know, NAACP doing marches, um, you know, protesting some, you know, uh, policies with the Mormon church. Um, you know, but even those, like they, you know, the big ones were like maybe 300 people historically. And then um, there was an IWW rally in 1913 that attracted like 500 people, um, you know, which back then Salt Lake City was significantly smaller. So 500 people is nothing to sneeze at. Right. But, um, and the consequences for protesting back then, as, as we'll, we'll get to, but the, the consequences were ex really, really uh, It was harsh. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was a slight, I mean, not that it's easy now. Uh, of course, people were getting shot and hit with cars and all sorts of stuff. But back then, it was also a, a very dangerous uh, or perhaps even more dangerous activity. Uh, yeah, it's, um, the, 
you know, we've had big marches. We've had thousands of people out before and things like that. Um, you know, historically speaking, uh, you know, in, in kind of pick an issue too. like the, the first tea party rally here was massive. Right. But um, you know, that, that's a different side of the spectrum, but uh, that how about really Joe big. Hill funeral. Um, there were maybe the Joe Hill funeral here. Uh, the funeral parade was a couple hundred people. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was um, really big in other places like Chicago. I think it was like Chicago was massive. Or... Like the, the, what they did here, they, they, um, they were the, the funeral here just by circumstances, they were forced to keep it kind of small because it was so controversial and there was so much mis misinformation being spread around about the wobblies at the time. Um, they had a really hard time getting a venue for the funeral because, um, there was this private detective agency in town at the time that was going around saying that any place that was nice to the Wobblies was going to get blown up. And so there were, there were a lot of, a lot of like they, they reserved, they had a place reserved that would have sat like 1500 people. And then that place backed out. And so they, they did it at a funeral parlor downtown and maybe there were 50 people there. And then, you know, there's a huge crowd outside, but a lot of it seems like from the records we have, a lot of it seems like it was curious looky loose more than people who were there to uh, participate and pay homage and things like that. So the actual parade, I think there were just a few hundred people. And then when he got to Chicago, it was like 30,000, you know, it was huge. Right. And what's, what's been going on in terms of mutual aid projects in the past few months in, in Salt Lake city. It, it... Well, so the, um, there is there is a mutual aid group that kind of sprung up at the beginning of COVID, and um, they were they were doing things like the, the you know mutual aid groups tend to do you know they were doing uh, grocery shopping for uh, you know people who maybe were shut in because you know they were on quarantine or they were at health risks and things like that, and then as this last few months has continued to unfold and the you know the landscape has just changed pretty drastically uh the mutual aid groups now are you know they're doing uh you know support for the marches you know though you know street medic kind of stuff the food water um first aid supplies for people who are marching like if you don't have a mask you can go to the, the, the mutual aid people there and they'll hook you up with a mask uh it's the it's it's what you would expect to see in a situation mm -hmm. like this and it is, has there been any activity going on around there in terms of rent strikes or wildcat strikes or things that have been happening in some other places? Nothing like that here yet that I'm aware of. Um, there, there were some actions um, kind of early on where they, uh, especially in COVID, where some of the some of the groups in town, like uh, you know, democratic socialist groups and things like that, were, and some other activist groups in town were uh, distributing like renters' rights flyers um at uh, you know at different apartment complexes in like lower income neighborhoods that you know where there's a fear fear there would be uh you know evictions and things like that but there hasn't been anything that i'm aware of as specific as a rent strike but in terms of evictions is, is the any idea what the situation is with uh, any kind of suspension on evictions there it, it seems yeah to be they they put a moratorium on them for a while and then um I'm not sure if that's been lifted yet or not. And then even with that, with COVID, with the courts being shut down, there wasn't a way to have a hearing. So a lot of that stuff just got kind of, you know, anyway. But They're not doing eviction hearings on Zoom the way they do. They are in Arizona. <laughs> Man, I'm, I haven't heard about that. No. You heard about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's lovely. Yeah, it's it's apparently not safe, uh, not safe to hold the court, but it's safe to evict people onto the street. Yeah. Street. yeah. But, but in terms of your work, how has that been affected by the pandemic, though? I'm just curious, just like, I mean, have you just been out there doing uh, do foot photography and every covering events like normal or uh, with a mask on? I mean, what? how has it affected? So um, uh, because of my role, like, I'm, you know, it's uh, I, I rarely go out and shoot pictures anymore. Oh, you okay. know? and so but my staff, you know, they're out there every day. And so, um, yeah. in an effort to keep them safe, um, you know, we, we, uh, we have some pretty, 
you know, upfront conversations with like, you know, like let's pretend I was coming to your place to, you know, your home to photograph you. Um, I, you know, a lot of times where I'm having conversations with, you know, you about, you know, what the situation is, you know, like, are you guys on quarantine? Is anybody at a health, you know, um, you know, at risk, you know, mm-hmm. cause, um, my staff's been out there all day, every day since this started. Um, I don't know what we've been exposed to, you know, especially now with all the protest marches, you know, we're covering these every day and, you know, protesters for the most part are wearing masks, but you know, you get a couple thousand people crammed into a city street. There's not a lot of distancing or anything. Um, so far, as far as I'm aware, they've only been able to track two cases of COVID specifically to the marches, which I think is pretty remarkable because we are in the mm-hmm. middle of a huge spike right now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in the last couple, couple of weeks there's been uh at last two or three weeks there's been like eight thousand new cases and only two of them have been from protest marches you know so that's interesting but anyway with that in mind like not knowing what my staff has been exposed to um i don't want any of them getting sick and i don't want them spreading something around to somebody who might get sick so we've done things where like if we're shooting a portrait of somebody maybe we stand outside and we look through the window and, you know, get some, try to get some nice light on them or, or something like that. Or, you know, we're doing a a lot of things outdoors. Um, I've um, turned down photo requests from reporters. If, um, you know, if they're inside and there's just not a safe way to keep distance, Um, you know, we're uh, just trying to be really cognizant of that because it's everything's weird. <laughs> yep. <why>. Everything's weird. <laughs> so. And it, but then it gets the the sort of extra complication for for journalists in lots of other professions, but I guess particularly with with journalists, is people are often going into situations that they expect might be not entirely safe. Like if you're covering a protest, for example. But I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because you know, like um, we haven't had somebody like slam a car into the crowd here, but you know people get annoyed when you've got all these marchers in the street. And so they'll like try to worm their cars through it. And, you know, to me, it just seems like it's a matter of time before somebody gets hit. And so, you know, I've, my staff and I have talked about that quite a bit and like, you know, so in addition to the normal things you have to worry about, which is, um, you know, cars coming through or, you know, how the police are interacting with crowds and stuff like that, you know, like p- the potential for arrest at some of these things, um, you know, in addition to all that, there's also this uh, virus going around. And so it's just, it's kind of, it's a lot to, it's a lot to have on your mind. Absolutely. And have the police um, been, uh, have the police been, have they, have they been attacking people for marching in the streets or have they been more uh, escorting the marches when they take the streets? For the most part, um, they've been like blocking intersections and things like that. Um, there was a really quiet protest here. Um, I forget the exact dates, but it was on a Friday, right? And there were maybe 25 people. It was uh, held at a Unitarian church. Uh, black, you know, they just went out with picket signs and were, you know, Black Lives Matter signs and were just kind of, you know, it was uh, waving at traffic as it went by. And then the next day, um, there was one where just thousands of people showed up down at the police station. And um, that one got uh, pretty crazy. Um, uh, um, demonstrators, uh, uh, like a, a police car was set on fire. There's a video that's going around of a dude who like drove into the crowd and got out with a bow and arrow and was like trying to shoot people. I don't know if you've seen that. And wow. No, he got, trying to shoot protesters. Yeah. He's trying to shoot protest. He was yelling all lives matter and trying to shoot protesters with a bow and arrow and, um, the crowd Why descended on him. Arrow? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> was there some kind of a political point there with the bow and arrow? But I mean, well, I guess, he uh, was a uh, less jail time than killing somebody with a gun. Maybe I don't know. No, he was. Uh, um, he'd been in prison, and so he couldn't. Ha- he couldn't own a gun, <sighs> so he had a bow and arrow. God. And so, and but then he found out that he also wasn't supposed to have a bow and arrow, and so he's going back to prison on for you know <laughs> weapons with a uh, you know restricted whatever it is i forget there's a there's a litany of charges against him because it's not a good idea to try to shoot people with a bow and arrow no nope, really but, bad potentially deadly but the crowd descended on him kicked mm. the crap out of him flipped mm. his car over and set it on fire you know it was That's um quite a response yeah yeah i mean he was he was trying to kill people though like, yeah it's a very you know, proportionate like, response uh, really, they didn't like, kill yeah, him 
it was a, it was a, that was a crazy day. And that one went, that one started early in the morning and went into the wee hours of the following morning. And, you know, like people were getting shot with rubber bullets. And uh, we did a story about um, uh, the main, the central place of this thing was like at our police station in a library that's right across the street from the police station. And there's a homeless man that I've known for a while who lives at the police station. He was on the ground and one a police officer ran up and shot him in the back with a beanbag gun while he was on the ground being handcuffed. Like it, it was, it was something else. But, um, so the following day there wasn't a March, um, you know, there, there just wasn't a March the following day. And like, there's graffiti all over the city, like the Capitol, there's tons of graffiti on the state Capitol, all over the building. Like people were throwing rocks through windows at the police station. Um, it was, it, it was a big day, yeah. Yeah, but quite um, yeah, it, uh, so the next day there wasn't, it, the next day was pretty quiet. And then after that, there's been some kind of action every day um, in uh, in the midst of all this, uh, the Salt Lake City Police Department had to release uh, body cam footage um, where they uh, killed a young man uh, named uh, Bernardo Palacios Carvajal, um, shot him a number of times. And so that. Um, when? Uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and so the body cam has come out and that's really inflamed things. Uh, inflamed isn't the right word. Um, it has really galvanized uh, demonstrators. It's, it's um, f- further exposed to the, the the various crimes that are regularly committed by police in this country. Huh? Well, it, yeah, it's really just um, it's become a rallying point. You know, like the the uh, there's a lot of political pressure to get the investigation wrapped up quickly. Um, the the police department that was tasked with investigating the shooting has finished their portion of the investigation and given, uh, you know, given their information to the district attorney. And so now there's a lot of pressure on the district attorney to announce if he's going to press charges against the officers or not. And so uh, uh, the last several nights, the protest marches have started at the DA's office Mm -hmm. um, because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So there's a lot going on. A lot going on. And the police station is still there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Not not like uh, there's been s- certain cities uh, where the, where police stations have been abandoned. Yeah, we don't have a Chaz or a Chop here. No, no, ch- no Chop yet. No. Yeah. <laughs> so just uh, we are talking with Jeremy Harmon on Discussions with David, which you can hear live at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT, Wednesday through Friday every week along with other broadcasts I host at the same time on Mondays and Tuesdays. All of these broadcasts go out live on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Cable, Community Radio, and elsewhere. And they're all archived on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash drovix, on Patreon at patreon.com slash davidrovix, and in podcast form if you look for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform. Um Jeremy, when I first came to, uh, well, when I, I believe it was the, was it the first time we met as far as I re- recall in 2015, when I came to Salt Lake city or yeah for that. And, and yeah. you had been, uh, I, I don't think I realized that it was you behind so many of these articles I had been reading in the, in the, uh, Salt Lake Tribune, uh, but, uh, that you, you, you did exhaustive research. I mean, you must have been like um, reading those articles. It, 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 you must have been like, uh, I, I mean, I can't, I was imagining, trying to imagine what it might be like for you living in Salt Lake City and writing all these, uh, doing all this research about events that had taken place there a hundred years ago, which were especially notable events in the history of the labor movement. Uh, yeah, it was, um, and then you're seeing these same places, like the wall. I mean, it's a, the part of the wall where Joe Hill was executed is still there at the park. And I mean, there's uh, so many other buildings. I imagine uh, probably most of them aren't there anymore. But a lot of the, the neighborhoods. I mean, the streets, uh, the same names. What? I, I, yeah, it's kind of it's really interesting. So, like, you know, I've always been um, like a music junkie. And I'm one of those music nerds that if I like a record, I have to know what influenced it. And I, you know, and I go backwards on everything. And so there's a lot of that. There's a, you know, a lot of American music. If you trace it backwards, you invariably end up with the IWW's Little Red Songbook Mm. and Joe Hill, right? 
And so I, I was aware of him as being, um, you know, uh, a songwriter who influenced, you know, Woody Guthrie, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that, that's kind of where I was. And, um, I, I didn't know a lot of details. And then, um, uh, there's a, uh, I picked up a book, uh, you know, cause again, like I like to read the stuff. And so I, I picked up a book about Joe Hill and read it. And, um, so somehow I had no idea that he had such a, I know, I knew there was some kind of tenuous tie to Salt Lake city, but I didn't know that it was Salt Lake city. Right. I just didn't. And so it blew my mind. And, um, I live really close to Sugar House Park where the prison was. And I take my kids there to play pretty frequently. Mm. And so like, just like I, I was the, the book just like, I was just completely enamored with the story. And, uh, and then after that, I started trying to learn as much about it as I can't, as I could, you know, and, uh, like I'm a Billy Bragg fan and I run across the story of him eating the ashes, you know, stuff like that. And, um, in, uh, in 2014, um, you know, late 2014, I was in an editor's meeting at work and, um, we started talking about projects, you know, like more long-term projects that we wanted to do for the next year. And um, one of the other editors in the room said, well, there's this like famous execution here in 1915. We're coming up, you know, in about a year, it'll be the hundredth anniversary. Maybe we should do something to talk about that. And, and, and I was like, Oh, you're talking about the Joe Hill thing. And I just started blah, 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 blah. You know, like I read this book. It was amazing. This Billy Bragg guy, he did this weird thing. Like we should, you know, talk about that. And I started talking about the songs and, um, I thought I knew a lot about the story at the time. And so, um, you know, kind of weaseled my way into the group that was working on that project. And, um, we started, um, uh, we, we decided we wanted to start doing some of our, like our own research into what had happened. And, and then because I'm, uh, you know, because I run the photo side of it and like for a while I, I had this like, historical photo column I was doing once a week, you know, about different things mm. in the city. And I'd been looking for IWW photos and I'd been looking for photos of things like specifically related to the Joe Hill case and just kept, just never could find anything. And so anyway, we started reaching out to people and stuff like that. And, um, you know, we were able to track down a number of descendants of people who, um, were there, you know, like, you know, you know, key players in these, in this story. And, you know, they had family photos or they had, you know, old family memoirs and things, you know, like some really fascinating things that I think just added a lot of um, context to what was going on in Salt Lake city at the time that, you know, frankly is missing from some of the uh, biographies. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're so focused on Joe that like, I feel like we were able to kind of break out from, just the Joe part of the story and get into more of the, the context of what was going on in Salt Lake city. And, and how yeah, did this, how, what, how did this happen? Right. And, and that, that's what was so good about the whole series too, was that the whole local context that you put it in, which I think must've been, uh, uh, which seemed quite clearly to, to be of particular interest to a lot of locals. I mean, I think a lot yeah. of people were living in the, in, in, in 1915, in 2015, you know, through, through your articles. But. Well, it was one of the things that was like, um, you know, there's this joke in Salt Lake city that, you know, everybody's connected to everybody else. Like, cause you know, Salt Lake city is a, it's a big city, but it's not a huge city, you know? And so a lot of people call it small Lake city, because if I know somebody and you know, this person, like I can connect almost anybody in the city really quickly because everybody knows everybody, you know, it's a big little town, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, um, you know, my, my family has been here, like the Harmon family has been here since 1847. My ancestors wow. were on the first wagon train with Brigham Young that rolled into the valley. And so, you know, like there's a lot of us around. And uh -huh. um, it, like one of the things that like just really blew my mind when we were doing this was, um, yeah, and this is more of a personal aside, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. um, so the grocer who was murdered, um, that Joe was convicted of, you know, that the frame up, all that, like, uh, right. the, gro the grocer, um, his wife 
um, was cousins with my third great grandfather, right? Who was a cop here at the time mm. and it helped with the investigation. <laughs> yeah. And like, I had no idea, you know, like, and so just like finding that kind of stuff. And so we tracked down some descendants of the grocer and like some of the pictures they gave us are just fascinating. And like, and even the pictures they gave us raise all kinds of other questions. Cause like, mm. um, one of the photographs that, um, um, they gave that they have, you know, it's like a family heirloom. Now one of these photographs they have, um, um, for people who are familiar with the story. So it was Joe Hill and Otto Applequist, right. Who were thought to be the guys who went in and held up this grocery store. Well, they have a photo of Otto. The photo of Otto was, um, distributed by police to the papers and stuff like that. Cause they were trying to find him, Right. Well, they have the original copy of that photograph. And so it's like the family ties to the police department and things like that. It's like, you know, it's, I mean, you know, were the police giving the family evidence after the fact? Cause like they have this photograph, like in that belonged to the police department and the, the photograph has a little arrow drawn on it, which is what they would do back then. If you know, if you, if, cause it's a big group photo of a bunch of iron workers and there's Otto in the middle of it. And so they drew an arrow pointing at Otto. So they, when the picture was copied and sent around to the papers, they knew which guy to focus on for the mug shots. And so, you know, you go back to the Salt Lake Tribune uh, from this time, and there's that exact mug shot in the Salt Lake Tribune from this photo that the family has. And so seeing the, uh, I, I made a big, I made a really nice copy of the whole photo and we have that on the website, but seeing that in its original context of him with all these other workers, um, on this building and, and even the building, it was a, the building was a project that was uh, done for the Eccles family, which is a really uh, wealthy family here. You know, they're like philanthropists, their names on tons of buildings in the state, stuff like that. So it was an Eccles project. Well, the, uh, you know, before earlier when I was talking about, um, there was a, a, an IWW rally that attracted about 500 people. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was after they had won a strike against a company owned by the Eccles family. So there's mm -hmm. just like all this like interconnection and all these things. And um, to me, that's just like that kind of context. Um, um, I've done podcast interviews about the Joe Hill case and they always have to ring me in and say, well, we actually talk about Joe because I'm talking about all these down, down in the weeds characters. But to me, the down in the weeds characters really help explain um, yeah. the political climate and the um, – what happened to, you know, like, like if you get all that, like, I think you, you understand the political climate that led to Joe's execution and you also get greater clarity into uh, why he never offered up an alibi for himself. Cause like there were so many IWW guys who were being targeted by the police during this time. And like, there's another IWW guy who was killed only about three weeks before Joe's execution, but he was just gunned down in the street by the police. Wow. And so, you know, like, Joe would have known all this was going on. And then he's got the police come and say, Oh, well just tell us who your friends are. You can trust us. Well, you just shot my friend. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> right? Of course. And so it's, it's all these other characters that are in the story that I think um, really provide some clarity and like answer some of the mysteries of, uh, you know, some of the mythology of the, of the Joe Hill case. Um, right. You got to put, it has to be in context. And that's what's one of the frustrating things about reading biographies for me is that, uh, you know, as interesting as they can often be, it's the yeah. context that really makes it more interesting. And it's always, it must be a, something that people writing biographies have to struggle with because there's always more context that you could provide. Oh yeah. There's so much more. Like um, I've said this to a few people and it always raises some eyebrows, but like, um, uh, to me, for me personally, like having like all the letters I've read, all the, you know, all the, you know, the memoirs, the interviews, you know, talking to descendants, all that kind of stuff. Um, to uh, You know, a lot of people make a, a, a lot of hay out of, uh, you know, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and her involvement in the Joe Hill case and all that kind of stuff. And, and for my money, she's not even close to the most interesting woman um, in the story. Uh there was a there was a local woman here that hardly anybody ever talks about or mentions. Uh, her name was Virginia Snow. Uh, mm -hmm. She was an IWW organizer. She set up a like she founded a, a, a local branch here in Salt Lake City that was uh, specifically for housemaids. You know, she was with the IWW. She had been involved in for, specifically for housemates. You said housemaids. 
housemates, housemates. Yeah, uh, housemates. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, uh, she she had been involved in all kinds of like activist causes for years, years and years. And um, there's a really obscure uh, um, IWW speaker who was on the West Coast name. Um, um, Agnes Flair, Agnes Fair, Agnes Thecla Fair. And, um, she wrote the sourdough Bible. If you've ever heard of that, that that's a pretty interesting document, but, um, the, what's you know, the she, sourdough Bible is, is it a radical text of some kind? Yeah. It's, it's a book of poetry and songs and stuff like that. It, it predates the IWW and, um, it seems like it was really influential on like IWW poetry and songs and things like that early on. Um, it, I, I, for, I forget off the top of my head when it was published. Um, but it's, uh, it was a book of, it was a book of poetry and songs and articles for working class people. And it probably came out like late 1800s. Um, yeah, 18, it's probably somewhere in the 1895 to 1905 range, but don't quote me on that. Cause I mm-hmm. do not remember, but anyway, it predates the IWW mm-hmm. and, um, you know, but um, Agnes would come to Salt Lake City to do organizing among mine workers here. And like when she came into town, she'd always stay with Virginia. Like, you know, she's just really connected in all this stuff. And um, you go back and read the newspapers at the time. And she always gets dismissed as being this busybody art teacher at the U, University of Utah, who uh, shouldn't be sticking her nose in where it doesn't belong. And there was a lot of uh, there's a lot of consternation and pearl clutching about her involvement in the case because her father was Lorenzo Snow. Um, he was dead at the time, but Lorenzo Snow was uh, one of the early prophets of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You mm-hmm. know, so, so um, you know, this is a, you know, she was born at a time when like polygamy was like still really big in Utah and all that kind of stuff. And so she was like, I'm going to paraphrase terribly, but think of her as she was kind of like the youngest daughter or the youngest wife of this guy. And so she was she quite a big... Been. Yeah, she was quite a bit younger than her father. Right. And he'd been dead for maybe 15 years when the Joe Hill thing bubbled up. But um, but because daddy had been the prophet, you know, she's like um, in all the right social circles. And so, so they can't in, just lock her up or yeah. shoot her. Well, they, they did eventually run her out of town. Wow. You know, um, she got fired from the University of Utah for her involvement in the case. They, they actually passed a law that... Um, college professors, if they wanted to be involved in uh, political activities outside of the university, they had to have express permission of the university president. Um, you know, which that didn't last because, you know, first amendment, that's not going to last, but, um, the, the university president got fired for not reining her in. Um, it would, in, uh, the papers, there's this one paper in town at the time that I love reading. It's, it's called Godwin's weekly. And it was, a uh, it was a very conservative uh, weekly newspaper at the time, um, you know, reactionary kind of stuff. But it's a great source for understanding what was going on with a lot of these folks because, um, you know, they were always just in a total hissy fit over everything Virginia Snow was doing. Like they just couldn't believe that, that you know, the daughter of the prophet is, you know, hanging out with all this rabble. And so it's great because they freaked out about everything she did. So because of that, we know everything she did. Yeah, right. You know, that's, and that's and beautiful. the the main papers in t- like the the more you know the daily newspapers like the Salt Lake Tribune um, were like just really dismissive of her in the coverage. You know, and just oh, she's just an art teacher; she doesn't know what she's talking about. No, she'd been in the fight for decades at this point. You know, f- uh, for in her entire adult life, she'd been in the fight, and so it just totally makes sense that she's the one when. Uh, when Joe was convicted, she's the one who went and got, went to Denver and talked to Orrin Hilton into representing Joe for his uh, appeal. Like she was super involved. Wow. And, you know, I'm not trying to downplay what Gurley Flynn did, but, um, but, but there's so many others that just, there's get so like much that, more yeah. that was going on. You know, like Gurley Flynn came to town one time, met with Joe, gave a speech. And then, you know, she did get the president of the United States to intercede on his behalf. That's, that's nothing that's nothing small. And it's not like Woodrow Wilson was like a big union fan, you know, so I, I can't even wrap my head around how they pulled that off, you know, but I know, that's also amazing that, and that they, I mean, yeah, 
I'm, well, I was just, just going to say, I, was, I interviewed somebody the other day uh, for Fifth Estate Live, Kathy Ferguson at the University of Hawaii, and she has an amazing database of anarchist women uh, from the basic time period of the life of Emma Goldman around this same oh, okay. time period. And there's just like, she wrote a book about Emma Goldman, but the, but there's so many others, uh, really uh, uh, brilliant uh, women who were, you know, obviously heavily involved with all sorts of organizing of, uh, in the IWW and so many other yeah groups but they, you know that it's kind of interesting because um oh I, her name just totally out of my head mm -hmm. uh she was she was in detroit um and she ended up at the university of michigan in ann arbor as a librarian there mm. what was her name i'm i'm forgetting her name but um so she had been, she'd been a wobbly, she'd been an anarchist, all this kind of stuff. And then she got a job at the university of Michigan and she's the one who set up the Labadee library there mm. um, because they found some of his papers like stuck in a closet. And she's like, Oh, these need to be preserved. And so she started pre preserving them. But then she's like, Oh, Hey, you know, we could turn this into a whole collection. And so she started using her connections from her IWW days to reach out to people and, you know, Hey, send me your papers. She was doing this in the thirties and forties. And um, that's why the that's why University of Michigan has that incredible um, labor archive there and anarchist archive there is because this um, God I cannot believe I'm forgetting her name but um, uh, she was fascinating you know like uh, they've got a lot of Ralph Chaplin's papers there uh, from his IWW days and like from when he was in Leavenworth um, after Agnes? the big IWW it, trial was her name Agnes something? yes. This has been, uh, we have uh, an IWW scholar from Australia who's up at two in the morning watching this broadcast. So she just, uh, is that <laughs> Paula? Her, Paula, yeah. She yeah. just said uh, Agnes something. Yeah. Um, have you seen the archive at, at the University of Washington of uh, the IWW archive? Just it's, online. I haven't personally yeah, online. Yeah. It. But it's just, um, I, I find it, it, it just gives you an amazing sort of overview of the state uh, apparatus and how they were coming down on the IWW uh, during uh, that time. Yeah, here, I'm going to, I'm going to do the share screen thing here. I want to show you something oh, yeah. I photographed when I was in Michigan. Uh huh. Um, let's see. Um, okay. So this is a really interesting thing. This is an autograph book. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with Ralph Chaplin, Solidarity Forever? Ralph Chaplin, uh, one of the uh, other many great songwriters and, and yes. organizers in the IWW. He was also chairman for a time, wasn't he? Of the, of the he was in the he was on the um, general executive board, mm -hmm. but he was uh, um, Bill Haywood was the secretary when mm -hmm. Chaplin was on the board, but he he was never he was never the guy. Right. Um, he was under Haywood. But so uh, when they were in the Cook County Jail during the big um, IWW trial, um, Chaplin had an autograph book with him. And th this is the first page of it. It's signed by every IWW member who was in jail with him at that time. And it has their cell number and where they were from and what industry they work in. Mm. So you got Vladimir Losiev here, cell 28 uh, from Russia. He was in public surface. Ralph Chaplin, also in cell 28, um, born in Ames, uh, Ames, Kansas, he, uh, an artist, Herbert Mahler, um, who ended up, you know, he lived out his last days in uh, Seattle. Uh, you've got William D. Haywood right here, from Salt Lake City, Utah, mm. um, for gathering of the industrial democracy, Cook County Jail, cell number 25. It's a fascinating document. Um, and the notes were made uh, to um, just sort of like the way you write down names for, to give to the lawyer when you get arrested to make sure nobody gets kind of falling through the cracks. Or it was an autograph book that okay. Chaplin kept, kept while he was. He just had everybody sign it while he was in there. Right. Um, this is his. This, a lot of people have probably seen this. This is his mugshot from uh, when he was incarcerated in Leavenworth after that trial. But then, yeah, you've got this. This is. Um, this, Ralph this was really when, neat when he was incarcerated. That. What's that? When Ralph Chaplin was incarcerated. Yeah, 1918. 
And um, this was this was at the uh, the the this sort of uh, ostensible uh, re, re, accusation was that he was a German spy or something like that. Was it? It was no. A, a they um, are you familiar with the with the nineteen seventeen trial? Um, there there was there were a series of coordinated raids all across, on IWW halls all across the United States where they were arresting uh, local organizers. They rounded up uh, around a hundred people took them all to Chicago and it's to, to date, it's the largest mass trial in uh, US history. And so they tried all these guys, thousands of pages of documents and they um, more or less the charges were conspiring against the war effort because the IWW was leading strikes in you know, so many different industries you know, that uh, directly affected the war, uh, World War I, you know, like uh, you know, if they were doing a, a you know, like uh, they were doing strikes, you know, like, uh, you know, copper mines and, you know, the, mm. you know, you needed the copper to make bullets, you know, stuff like that. And they were and explicitly ex against the war. They called And the explicitly war. against the war and, ex and explicitly against the draft. And so, um, you know, and they clearly they weren't the only radical group that was against that. But the IWW, because they'd just been raising hackles all over the country for, you know, at this point talking about, you know, 12 years, um, the United States had decided they just had enough. They rounded up all these guys and tried them. And um, when they were convicted, everybody was found guilty and given sentences ranging from five to 20 years in prison. Like Chaplin was given 20 years. He only ended up serving four because once the war ended, um, it got to a point where it was uh, embarrassing for the United States to have um, – we, we were the last uh, of the major countries to release political prisoners who were um, arrested during the war. Mm. And so um, there, there was this whole campaign to get them out, stuff like that. And it's really kind of interesting because, you know, if we want to talk about what Ammon Hennessy was doing here in the 60s. Yeah. Um, Another prominent Salt Lake City radical. And and one uh, one thing I, I didn't realize when I was reading your article about Ammon Hennessy was that when he came to Salt Lake City, it was more or less... Uh, uh, sort of under orders uh, from Dorothy Day. Uh, I'm actually Department. wrong on that. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, uh, so he'd been in New York. Uh, it's kind of funny because I put that in the article and uh, Joan Thomas, his widow called me and I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> Why did you say that? That was her only, that was her uh, only comment on the article that I wrote. Um, uh, I should probably go back and fix that. But um, the, now, he'd been in New York in the 50s uh, working with the Catholic Worker Program, right, and uh, the movement there. And then he decided that he was going to come out in, in 1960. He decided he was going to come to Salt Lake City and start a Catholic Worker House here and name it after Joe Hill. And then he ended up coming here permanently uh, in 1961. And they opened the uh, – he came with another Catholic Worker, a woman named Mary Lathrop. And she's amazing, by the way. She's a she's a really great woman. She's still living in New York and is still um, with the Catholic Worker. Mm. But um, she, they came out here and started it up, and then they opened the Joe Hill House and that they named after Joe Hill. They opened the Joe Hill House in 1961, and uh, in November of 61, because they did it that month because that was the month Joe was executed. They they wanted to kind of memorialize him. Um, this flyer right here. Yeah, um, I love this flyer. This is and for the people who are going to be listening to this as a podcast, let's let's just read it. It says, "Can can you read it to us?" Because you can. Yeah. See so it better. this is a flyer that was distributed by the Young Men's Anti-Militarist League of Columbus, Ohio. Young men, are you going to refuse to register for military service in a foreign country while the rich men who have brought on this war stay at home and get richer by gambling and foodstuffs? We would rather die or be imprisoned for the sake of justice then kill our fellow men in this unjust war. Signed, Young Men's Anti-Militarist League of Columbus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the members of the Young Men's Anti-Militarist League of Columbus who's distributing these flyers was Ammon Hennessy. And, that and was, those flyers were from the First World War? Yeah, this is from World War One. And so, um, so Ammon was arrested, and he did two years um, in the federal penitentiary in um, Atlanta, Georgia. 
there was another person in prison in Atlanta, Georgia at that time who Ammon met and was a huge influence on Ammon. And it was Alexander Berkman, the Russian anarchist. Ah, really? And, and Alexander Berkman was at that time in prison, but that was late that he wouldn't have been in prison for shooting, uh, Frick at that time. It this is after Frick. Else. He he is also in prison for the you know impeding the war effort kind of stuff, speaking out against the war. Mm. And so um, also at this time, Eugene Debs was in the prison in Atlanta. Um, so, so you kind of have a who's who, <laughs> yeah, in prison there. Like wow. um, you know, uh, there's the stories about um, there are the stories about when. Um, Ammon, uh, sorry, Eugene was uh, running for president as a convict. This, this is that time period. Um, uh, um, Debs was... And while in prison, I think he got a million votes. Uh, if, if it I was more than that. I think more it, than a yeah, million. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was not insignificant. Um, yeah. I, 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 I used to know the percentages off the top of my what percentage of the popular vote he got, but it was... Uh, it was, it was hefty like if a third party candidate got what he got while he was in prison they'd be doing backflips that you know they'd be so excited mm. um uh, okay so ammon starts hanging out with his hero alexander berkman while they're in prison um, um ammon uh continues you know being kind of a for lack of a better word a troublemaker um, he leads a strike, a, a sit-in a sit strike against, you know, the quality of the food at the prison and stuff like that. So he gets put in solitary confinement. And um, he he's in solitary for eight or nine months of his two-year prison sentence. Um, while he's in solitary, the only book they will let him have is the Bible. Hmm. And so he reads it again and again and again and again and again. And in... Um, um, he becomes uh, converted, a true believer, you know, and uh, in his mind, there, there was no difference between what Berkman was telling him and what Christ was saying in the Sermon on the Mount. Sure. And so um, when he got out of, when he eventually got out of prison, um, that became his, his whole way of life. Like, he worked as a social worker for a while, but then couldn't um, couldn't reckon paying taxes um, because he didn't want to do anything to support the war effort. And so uh, he he quit his job as a social worker. He came out west to Arizona. He worked as a migrant farmer for a number of years, like all pretty much all through the 1940s, um, because you know he'd get his wages at the end of the day, and taxes were never deducted, and so he could just you know he just bounced around doing that. He actually went and lived with the Hopi for a little bit, uh, the Hopi Indians, because um, he felt like uh, you know their the you know their indigenous lifestyle and how they were organized, you know, because like Hopi never went to war, and so he really you know he wanted to go and learn more about that. And um, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, um, he starts writing articles for the Catholic Worker newspaper uh, on his ideas on like Christian anarchism and Christian pacifism, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he goes out to he goes out to New York to um, be be just be there and work with them and help, and um, uh, he joins the Catholic Church uh, sometime in the 1950s. And then comes out to Salt Lake City um, to, you know, start the Catholic Worker House here. And um, when he, when and he, he did, he did meet Dorothy Day in New York, though. I mean, he already oh, did they worked know. side by side for yeah, ten okay. years. Right? Yeah, right. like they were really close. I have a great photograph um, that was given to me by uh, one of Dorothy's granddaughters um, of Ammon and Dorothy holding her. Um, during her christening when she was a baby, oh. you, you know, like, yeah, they, um, they were, yeah, they, yeah, like, um, yeah, they knew each other quite well, you know, you know, at, at, Ammon lived at the, I mean, he lived at the Catholic worker house in New York, like seriously for almost 10 years. And, you know, so he was there, his job, you know, everybody kind of had a role. One of his roles there was um, answering all the mail when it came mm. in which is how he ended up developing a relationship with Joan Thomas, who he eventually married because 
um, she would write a, she told me the story and it, it's, it's adorable. There's no other way to describe it. She would write a letter to the Catholic worker asking for information. Ammon would write back. And she was raised that if you got a letter from somebody, it's impolite not to respond. So she would write uh -huh. back and then he would write back. And so they just kept, they just started this pen pal correspondence and got to know each other. And like, um, you know, before we got on, you know, uh, I mentioned this postcard, mm. you know, this, this postcard, Joan gave me this, this post and she would X them out when she had answered them. So she knew she didn't need to reply huh. to this one, but um, this, this postcard on the Catholic worker, uh, there you go. Catholic worker. Um, yeah. Uh, Catholic worker, 39 Spring Street, New York, New York, uh, November 26th, 1960. Dear Joan, glad to hear from you. And I wrote down your phone number uh, and about that 8 a.m. mass, uh, but can't tell that far ahead what my plans will be. I'll ask Dorothy to autograph a copy when they come in and we'll send it to you. I saw reviews of that Christian yoga book, but I'm so busy picketing that I read very little. However, I bought the third series of Krishnamurti. Have you read him? Um, I eat breakfast with two soft boiled eggs, toasted corn muffin and coffee, Thursday AM, and then nothing until Friday night. He was really into fasting. So mm -hmm. a lot of people would ask him about the mechanics of his fastings. When I go to the Mormons, I'll drink neither tea or coffee out of courtesy to them. See you then in Christ for peace. Amen. And so, you know, when, when I go to the Mormons, he's talking about moving out to Utah mm. um, to start the Joe Hill house. Um, you know, it's, it's just fascinating. Um, and so he got out here. And one of the things that's really interesting is um, so the Salt Lake Tribune did a story about him moving to uh, Utah to start this Catholic worker house, you know, but Utah has always been a very conservative place, right? So Ammon Although comes into town and it's also like- Also the, the lots of, uh, this, there's a certain amount of sort of uh, public mindedness of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And, and I mean, it, cons when you say conservative, you're talking about like uh, socially conservative, but not necessarily conservative in every sense, right? Like that, that the term is meant, I mean, maybe this well, is an aside. Um, so this time period, like the mayor of Salt Lake City, when Ammon moved into town, the mayor was a member of the John Birch Society. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, so like we're talking conservative. <laughs> right. Like, Got it. Uh -huh. Like, uh, yeah, some people who were in like key church lead, like there's at least one guy, his name is Ezra Taft Benson, who is uh, an apostle of the LDS church at this time. He was a member of the John Birch Society. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is very. And, and what was this about tea or coffee? He 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 just he was going to forego tea and coffee because yeah. So you know, the Mormons not Mormons don't drink tea and coffee. Is it that's caffeine? Because caffeine is a drug. Who knows why? I, okay. Anybody who tells you they know why is making it up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm I'm LDS. I'm Mormon. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Anybody who gives you a reason made it up. Do you, you drink know? tea or coffee? I don't. Uh -huh. I have. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of coffee, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Like, uh -huh. yeah, it just, um, anybody who gives you a reason why that is, is a, is yeah, a, cool. inventing stories. Uh, right. cause people like to, like, people like to have a reason. There's no reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, anyway, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the police, so like, uh, the police chief was a guy named Cleon Skousen, um, who wrote a book called the 5,000 year leap, which was a massive influence on Glenn Beck. You know, so like it's Salt Lake yeah. City was very on the very much on the right side of things on everything. Right. Um, uh, okay. Um, so Hennessy got to Salt Lake City so and Hennessy started gets the to Salt Joe Lake Hill City. House. Yeah. So the Salt Lake Tribune is writing this article about him coming into town. And they're like, you know, maybe you haven't heard of this guy. He's a self-described anarchist, whatever that means. And the... Um, the article literally ends with the sentence. Don't say you haven't been warned. <laughs> you know, it's like this totally tongue in cheek, like, look at this weirdo, you know? And um, yeah, don't say you haven't been warned. And then there really isn't any other, there, there's no other coverage about, you know, all the work he was doing to take care of homeless people in the community. Um, the Joe yeah, Hill house, ignored. just like, yeah, yeah. The Joe Hill house just continued to evolve and, you know, um, he, uh, it was in three different locations during Ammon's life. After he died, there was a small group of guys who tried to get it going in a fourth location, but it just fizzled out super fast. So it almost doesn't count, you know, but uh, there were three places where Ammon had it going. The health department would shut him down. 
Um, there's one where Dorothy Day gave him money to buy a house so that, you know, the health part, you know, the, the, city, the land, landlord couldn't evict him or something like that. And the city used basically a, a, you know, something like an eminent domain law to seize the house from him and sell it out from under him to stop him from doing that because the neighbors were complaining about all the people that he was letting stay at the house and stuff. And then the last location of it, um, they moved him out kind of by the city dump and there was a do county dog pound out there and like he's not going to be bothering anybody but he was also far enough away from like the downtown train stations and stuff like that that you know he wasn't getting transients who were getting off the trains and stuff like that anymore and mm -hmm. so the house uh, really became kind of like the the cultural hub for um you know, like Salt Lake City's anti-war movement and stuff like mm. that. And like he was hiding conscientious objectors there, you know, people who were trying to avoid the draft, like they were staying at the house and Ammon was hiding them. Um, there was a time period where like pe uh, young people who were traveling back and forth across the country, you know, like kind of making the pilgrimage out to San Francisco and Haight-Ashbury and all that, like they'd stop at the house and, you know, he'd always let them stay there. And, and um, as a fairly young, I mean, I guess Utah Phillips would have been older than that crowd, but he was uh, he was one of the folks who came through. Bruce yeah, so Phillips. Utah Utah was like a a, a a fixture at the Joe Hill House. Um, he met so uh, after after he got back from the from you know his military service in Korea, um, he met Ammon outside the post office one day because Ammon was picketing out there, and they got talking, and you know he invited him to come down and check out the Joe Hill House. And so he did. And that, that chance meeting is why we have Utah Phillips. Cause um, you know, he really started hanging out. Uh -huh. Yeah. By yeah, Utah's yeah. Own account. Yeah. 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 By his own account. Like, you know, uh, he, he got sober because of Ammon and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, but um, there's, I'm going to share my screen again really quick mm. to show you something. Um, let me, is it in here? Oh, yeah. the, the uh, Utah Phillips in a suit. Uh, well, this is something. Yeah, I can show that uh -huh. again, but I'm going to show something else here as well. Mm -hmm. um, can you see it? Here we go. Okay, so uh, this. Uh, mm -hmm. If I were free, Memorial Edition, Joe Hill House, 1967. This is a songbook that um, uh, Ammon, Bruce, and some local wobblies put together. It's got like lectures on like uh, labor history in Utah and then a ton of songs and they would use this at their Friday night meetings at the Joe Hill house. And so like, mm. this has got some of like Utah's early songs in it, oh, things great. like that. Cause uh, you know, uh, the, if you're not familiar with Friday night meetings with at a Catholic worker house, you know, every Friday they have somebody come in and speak on a different topic or they'll do a performance, you know, something to, um, uh, just intellectually stimulate the whoever's whoever's there, you know, give them some history. Uh, when I went to the Catholic worker house in New York uh, a while ago, the Friday night meeting was on, um, they did a dramatic reading of letters written by SNCC activists in the sixties. You know, it was really moving. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, yeah, there's that. And then um, after, um, uh, where's that picture? This is my bigger folder. Uh, let me, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Oh, here we go. Okay. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's Utah Phillips Utah leading Phillips. a march. This is an anti-Vietnam march, 64-65. Uh, um, there's a guy in town that I've, I've known for a number of years. Um, he was a student journal. He was a, he worked at the student newspaper at the university of Utah and um, would photograph uh, things. And this is a photograph that he took um, for an article he wrote for the student newspaper about this protest March. Great. And like, wow, amazing that he still has it. And yeah, love um, it. I love that picture. Um, you know, this, this is one of my favorite pictures of Ammon. This is um, out in front of the uh, state capitol in Utah. Mm. Um, I'll show you this from a different direction. So th this, is, this is from that same day. This is Ammon picketing. Um, Garcia, Rivenberg, and Polson were uh, three people who were um, on death row at the time. 
and Ammon was like very opposed to the death penalty. And so there was a lot of uh, organization and work to get these three guys off of death row. Mm. And, um, you know, they had done some not good things, you know, um, but they didn't, Ammon and the other activists in town didn't think that they should be executed. You know, they weren't trying to get them out of prison. They were trying to, you know, spare their lives. They were able to do it, which is fascinating. Wow. Um, which at the time, uh, who knew that was going to happen? But um, let me see this photograph. So this is him leaving his uh, picket. You know, you can see his, he's got his sign. He's got some mm. um, leaflets here that he was handing out and he's by himself. Mm. Um, I've talked to a lot of like older activists in town who, you know, maybe they were teenagers or in their early twenties in the early 1960s when Ammon first showed up. And um, I did an interview with a guy who went on to be just like a really important, like a uh, community activist, community leader, all that kind of stuff. And he was kind of shown the ropes by Ammon. Mm. Um, he was a young man when he met Ammon and he's like, you know, it was remarkable because at first he'd be out there by himself. And then, you know, the next time maybe there was somebody else. And the next time maybe there was yet another person. And so he talked about how just Ammon's determination to just be out there all the time started, you know, other people started showing up to these things. And then you end up, you know, four years later, there's this march of 300 people, you know, against the Vietnam War. But it started like this, you know, Ammon by himself. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things I really like about this picture that's become really, uh, when I see this, I just, I really reflect on this picture. He's about to walk down. Um, this is State Street in Salt Lake City where you can see these cars here. It's a big hill. Mm. Um, in January of 1970, he was walking up this hill on his way to a protest and he suffered a heart attack and right. uh, died in the hospital two days later. Right. On and so just a protest. Yeah. And so having a photograph of um, Ammon like by himself walking down that street to me is just like achieved a lot of, uh, you know, it's come to have a lot of personal significance. You are a wonderful history geek, Jeremy. <laughs> so, it's, it's just amazing great. when you can go and stand at the spot where these things happen. You know, I like, agree. Um, I, in November, uh, different groups always ask me to do a, you know, I invariably ask to do a walking tour of Salt Lake city where we go to a lot of the spots that were uh, germane to the Joe Hill story. And one of my favorite places to go is the street in Murray where he was living when he was arrested to like, to go stand on the sidewalk out in front of the house where he was arrested and talk about what happened there that night. Yeah. Um, you like, you just like, and it doesn't look like that at all anymore. It's townhouses now, right? Like it's, it, it, it's, but you know, you can go and stand in front of the townhouse where Joe Hill's house was, you know, so it's just really, it's really kind of interesting to go. And, you know, you look around the neighborhood and there's some old houses from the time period that are still there. And, you know, um, you can, t I can talk about who lived in the different houses and how they were involved and all that kind of stuff. And it's we just, definitely have to have part two of this conversation. <laughs> there's yeah, way, it's, there's uh, so a lot much, of radicals man. we need to talk about. Yeah. And you need to write a book as well. Um, but uh, there's only so much to do in life, I suppose. Yeah, there's a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> Way too much. Jeremy Harmon, thanks so much for joining me for the show. And I really would like to uh, make another plan to talk more about other radicals in Salt Lake City, perhaps in August, if you're available. But uh, Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah. There's one guy I like to talk a lot about whose name was Roy Horton. And um, I, I wish people, I wish more people knew about his story because um to me, he answered his his life story answers a lot of questions about the Joe Hill case and things like that. Like he was just really involved, and mm. um, he is a footnote on a footnote in most of the biographies. And I, I think he was a really significant character. So oh, we need to talk about him, yeah, and more on Virginia as well. Yeah, the Roy yeah. and Virginia stuff is all like super yeah. interconnected. And Paula says you should write several books. <laughs> <laughs> And Paula I, I, needs to mind her own business. <laughs> I can guarantee she'll read all of them. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's awesome. <laughs> she is. Take care, Jeremy. Thanks all so right. much for joining Thank me. You. See ya. And um, 
Thanks for tuning into this conversation with Jeremy Harmon in Salt Lake City. You can find this and other discussions with David in archived form in various locations, such as the Discussions with David playlist on youtube.com slash drovix, at patreon.com slash davidrovix, at soundcloud.com slash davidrovix, and on any podcasting platform if you search for the podcast This Week with David Rovix. I have a new album out on Bandcamp, which you can stream for free, called Notes from a Failed State. The music, the live stream broadcasts, and the podcasts are all free. But if you want to support my journalistic and musical efforts, plus have access to some exclusive offerings just for patrons, please join my Community Supported Art Program, or CSA, at davidrovix.com slash subscribe, or patreon.com slash davidrovix. Artists for Rent Control is now set up to start organizing an emergency eviction response team. Please go to artistsforrentcontrol.org and sign up. Tomorrow, I'll be talking with Jeremy Brecker, author of the groundbreaking labor history first published in 1970 called Strike, and author of many other great books and essays since then, and before then as well. Hope to see you again soon here in the Matrix and out on the streets. Don't pay the rent and don't be afraid of your neighbors. Mutual aid will get us through. Bye for now. <laughs>